guys. Okay, we have a wonderful presentation planned for you. And to host that presentation is a gentleman that I consider one of the patron saints of Star Trek. He and the Carson crew work tirelessly to help keep the faith and do all sorts of behind the scenes work uh, to help uh, Star Trek. And they're, uh, he's really great. They're all uh, great from the Carson group, but we love this guy. So we're gonna bring him out right now. I think most of you know Mr. John Van Sitters. Let's have a nice welcome for John. Here he comes. Ships? Do you unique playable ships? Do you have in your game? 
Well, we can cheat a bit because we have ships that uh, look the same but have different stats, but our number is around 800 the last I heard, so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot there. Um, you know, we, we tier things to different power levels and stuff depending on where you're at in the game, but um, it's pretty incredible. So, we'll, uh, we'll get started with some of the uh, slides here. Um, what you're seeing there is a look of the uh, new version of the Constitution class Enterprise from Star Trek Discovery uh, that you just caught a glimpse of at the end of last season. This is one of the more clear images of it that you would have seen to this point. Um, and just last week, or a little over two weeks ago, I guess now, at uh, San Diego Comic Con, Joe, your uh, your company, Novos, unveiled on the on the show floor there a full built lit. Uh, how how many inches is it? Like yeah. 34 inches. It's like 34, 35 inches. Uh, full size studio scale um, Enterprise ship, which is also on display over in the vendors room. Um, and this is the digital model uh, that was rendered by the people uh, that do the show. But then we have this lovely image, which is your model. Absolutely, and uh, that was actually shot like two days before San Diego Comic Con because we just got that model in. <laughs> I, 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 I know it was tight. That yeah, was very tight. <laughs> um, so I, I think everybody up here is working in some fashion towards um, including the ship in their line right now. Uh, what have been some of the challenges that you've had in, in working with this ship? Well, it's really because it's all been digital. There's no physical asset to take a look at, so it's really getting the digital asset, um, re-engineering it so that we can bring it into reality, and bringing it so that, well, how do we support the bases? How do we support the saucer section? Um, so the team at Department of X, run by John Dublin, uh, were able to basically reverse engineer this, and basically recreate this thing in physicality so that people can take it apart, uh, like the base tail covers actually come off. Uh, the, the deflector dish actually pulls out like a drawer and you can see the core behind it, which is really interesting. Um, the other thing to it is basically we wanted to show how this thing is engineered. Because people have always looked at the technical manuals for Star Trek. And they want to know well, like, well, how does it work, uh, a coil work. Where's the engine coming? Where's the ship? All that. So this is an opportunity to bring something physical into reality and uh, allow people to actually interact with it in a way that no one's able to interact with these things. And, and Ben, you've taken those digital models that, that were provided by production and uh, you've, you've created these renders of it which give an even more clear uh, view of it, but um, uh, these are actually the renders that, that you provided versus the ones that the, the, the production did, and they're yeah. astonishingly similar despite what they should be. They have some slightly different needs for them for yeah. publishing in the magazine versus the... Yeah, I mean, the there are issues like that, that, but I mean, we were also talking about the fact that um, we're in this weird phase now for digital models, where um, when they were creating the, the models for Voyager or Enterprise, they were making them in Lightwave, which is a piece of software that you can go and get, you know, and you can go and render that, no problem. Um, Pixamondo are now doing these in Maya, and they are complicated. Um, the textures of these can only be rendered if you are an incredibly big visual effects company with very, very expensive equipment. So we've had to go in and kind of re-engineer the digital files to get them to a point where we could use them and I think, you know, then fortunately we've been able to share that with a few of the other people on this, this panel. Um, and you do also discover things like I was going to ask because it, it's not finished, is it? This model. Oh, the model though. No. no. Because this model's in like one shot at the end yeah. of the series, so they they only needed it to be good enough for that shot. Right. There are some cheats in there too. Yeah. There's also some over engineering here. And it just for whatever reason they threw it in there. It could be anything like they 
problem with a model like this is that there are so many different views of it. And the, you know, the VFX artists are told, okay, well, we need this particular shot, and it only needs to be for three seconds. So you guys have had to embellish on details that just weren't there? Well, it's not so much embellishing, it's just, you know, looking at the, the model in different light and saying, okay, you know what, this is where this, uh, like the, the caps of the missiles, for instance. That was not something, the internals of it weren't shown on the 3D model. So we had to reverse engineer that. Yeah, well, the, it's basically the bit that's never been thoroughly worked out is the way the nacelle support struts connect to the nacelles. Exactly. There's a gap. Um, um, John Beef loves negative space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John didn't love that bit of negative space, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, but then also, the, the thing that amazed me about this is there's a bridge in there. Um, in this model, there is a bridge. And we know that at the time that we got the model, they had not built the set for the bridge. Exactly. So you were like, going, is this right? Is it not? I don't know. The, the, the bridge of the Enterprise may or may not concern elements of season two. And <laughs> therefore, cannot be discussed in any way. I like my head on my shoulder, so I will not. I think we, guess, that. we can guess there is a bridge on the Enterprise. Uh, what there, 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 there likely is. And there probably is like a captain's chair in there. I can tell you that in this model, there is a bridge with a captain's chair in there. Um, so, uh, moving on from this, there's. It's, all, it's always interesting with the Enterprise because uh, obviously over the years we've seen, uh, I'm not even sure how many different Enterprises between all the different versions as well as the versions that haven't existed on screen. Like you did uh, the NX refit that Doug Drexler designed. Uh, but there's another Enterprise that I know has a uh, place close to your heart that was never seen on screen but was designed by Matt Jeffries and that was the Enterprise from Star Trek Phase 2. Yeah. And which I think a lot of people may be seeing this for the first time, which is your renders of the ship. So can you talk a little bit about what it's like taking something that only existed on paper and actually turning it into a real ship. Well, it actually does exist. It did exist as a little bit more than paper. So, um, Brick Price, uh, Wonderworks, started to build the model. The model wasn't quite finished. Um, when they upgraded the Star Trek TV show in Star Trek The Motion Picture, it got kind of abandoned. But various bits of it were made, and in fact, there were some of the, the molds we used to make things that were redressed as the motion picture enterprise that were hung in Planet Hollywood. I mean, that, this is the kind of insane detail you find out when you're trying to make something that doesn't exist. Um, so there were, there's a very scanty selection of pictures of that model, um, and there were Matt's drawings. And to complicate matters, then there were Mike Minor paintings as well. Um, and you end up having to make all sorts of decisions. So for example, what colour was it? So Matt had originally intended it to be the same as the original series ship, um, just with a few changes. So his idea was that, uh, well basically he said his design was perfect, so why change it? Uh, <laughs> but he said the only thing he could see you changing would be the nacelles, which he figured were um, what he called quick change units, the idea being they were out there on the outriggers because they were dangerous, so the idea that basically you get exciting engine so you could upgrade the ship. So we had Matt's drawings, we had some pictures of the model, uh, and then we had to go away and build our own CG model of it, um, and then decide what colour the cell caps would be and what colour the ship would be. Um, and that gets into kind of personal personal preference, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a particularly satisfying one because it's not quite finished and you have to, have to make some choices. Um, whereas obviously with something like the Discovery Enterprise, you have to make choices, but you don't want anyone to know you've made any choices. Indeed. And uh, moving on uh, to Aaron and, and uh, Star Trek timelines, you, um, you you have ships in your game, um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, in your game you probably don't have any fans that are fairly outspoken about how they're represented or anything. Oh my. Uh, people care very deeply about our ships. Uh, to 
add on to what you said as the main characters, that's exactly how we treat them. It's another character progression system. You're going to get your ship. It goes on missions. It's there with you. You carry your staffing, uh, the bridge of each of those. So you get a very deep connection to their ships. There's 44 of them actively in the game now, and there's more coming all the time. Um, but we, we get called out for messing up. Uh, Especially um, if we mess up the armaments. If you accidentally uh, throw to our torpedo where they're supposed to be a phaser, um, it takes about 37 minutes for us to get 100 complaints about that, so we uh, care very much. Uh, it's really interesting though for us because we get to do things like explore how these ships, which never actually come together in the movies that you see in the television shows, what they're going to be like. And so you're spanning hundreds of years of Star Trek uh, history and bringing those technologies together and then taking it other places like, you know, the mirror universe and taking ships that should have never shown up there and getting to fight these against one another. So that's a lot of um, fun, but it also means that we have to be even more accurate because, you know, then you're actually asking the question, who would win, and answering it. So we get things like the Defiant, who everyone is incredibly attached to, and then there are things that you expect them uh, to fight, and then there are things that you don't expect to see the Defiant up against, and so you have to be very true to the story and treat ship like, it is another character who has a personality, who has strengths and weaknesses, and convey those not just in the gameplay, but visually people need to get it. So we try and pull with strong silhouettes. We have the Endorian Battle Cruiser because I really, really wanted Endorians in the game. Um, and we're really excited because uh, this month we're bringing out a new ship. Uh, people were very excited about DS9 with the 25th anniversary. We're doing a big Dominion war arc that starts tomorrow in the game. So we're actually, um, I think you have the next slide, going to bring out a new Jimdar Battle Cruiser, which we're really excited about. Uh, the Jimdar Fighter is already in there, so now we're doing the Battle Cruiser because, well, you know, why are you doing Dominion? not bringing in the chip to dark. So uh, we're really excited about those coming up and I'm checking the fans' faces right now and saying, mm, I, I need to know if I, I had any mistakes on that. They haven't released it yet. So if you're gonna be nitpicking, now's the time. It's a, it's a good time. You've still, you've still got some time to, to, to make some changes. Um, I do my favorite fact on the steps, actually, is the Jemba ships is that um, the Jemadar models are really colorful when you see them, and then they're not on screen. They look, the models look completely different than what you think they're going to look yeah. like. When, from like, like, like Christmas tree models. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we had to contend with that actually when we, we did our recent DS9 release, uh, Victory's Life for Star Trek Online, because um, we have a Jemadar faction now, and so we had to build, we rebuilt the Jemadar ships in the game. To, and I wanted them to look like the studio models. And then when we put it in the game, I got feedback from other developers like, "That's that's too purple. Like, yeah, that's too bright." I, I finally found out why. What? Why is that? So what happened is when they were doing, because they used to do video compositing on it, and they, in order to control it, they would, they needed the colors to be quite bright so that they could pull them out and could do that. So then they're all 50% desaturated from the studio world. Wow, anyone wow. wants to know. I wish we had this conversation like uh, six months ago. <laughs> yeah, I'd love it, right? We'll, we'll, we'll get you guys in touch. Yeah. Um, so, Captain Hallmark has had a long history with Star Trek and ships. Um, it is every year, I think, one of the big things that people want to know is like, what's what's going to be the new Christmas order? What, what ship is it going to be this year? Um, and that continues ever since 1991 and the very first um, Hallmark uh, ornament, which really ushered in a new uh, era for everything. And I think everybody kind of vastly underestimated how much demand there would be for hanging spaceships on a Christmas tree. Uh, but we know now, including us, including, us. In, including you, and I, I, there are some people that I think know this, but can you talk briefly about what that ornament was originally supposed to look like? Sure. Um, well, uh, keepsake ornaments, 
instead of, uh, like everyone else, when they're using Starship to tell a story, our goal is to use Starship to capture memories. And the, so this came out in 1991, and as you can probably tell, our strategy was no one has any decent memories of what the Enterprise looks like, <laughs> so we went with this. Uh, the, uh, the structural problems with the uh, um, with this ornament is, I mean, the primary hull is way too thick, um, as dictated by underwriter laboratories, because we had to put the wiring in somewhere. The nacelles are way too short, because it literally didn't fit the physical merchandiser that we had planned to put that in in the stores, and, the, and uh, the decision of Hallmark was to lop that off. I will tell you this, that you can thank Lynn Norton for what it could have been um, the original intention. This was the first time that Hallmark had ever done a pop culture ornament that didn't have any real Christmas ties. The red and green lights are as close as we can get to Christmas on this, but what had come through revisions internally was that the primary hull was going to be looped in garland. <laughs> oh. And, and Santa Claus was going to pop out of the bridge. And I am not kidding. And uh, Lynn, Norton, that, right? yeah, <laughs> Lynn, Lynn Norton, uh, the original sculptor who went on to sculpt uh, ships for us for 25 years, uh, fought against that, saying that we would lose credibility and we would never have the chance to work with the Star Trek license again. He got it as close as he could to screen accurate in the 1991 version. Thankfully, he had a chance to redeem himself in 2006. 2006 for the 40th anniversary, he worked on that. That actually this is the pilot one from that's uh, yeah that, that um, yeah that's the 2016 um, which we did for the 50th. It originally in stores was painted all gold, gold for the 50th anniversary. Again, um, going into our uh, strategy of capturing memories. But for our event exclusives at San Diego Comic Con as well as New York Comic Con, we did as close to a screen accurate paint as we could. But that was based on the 1964 shooting model, and you'll notice the, the uh, bridge dome is bigger. Uh, they got the spikes on the on the nacelles. The deflector dish is bigger. And the cool thing about that is that uh, it was those facets of the ship, if I remember correctly, that were incorporated into the uh, um, the redo for the Blu-ray uh, in the ISS Enterprise. If you look at the difference between the USS Enterprise and the ISS they, Enterprise... Yeah, in the original episode they used uh, flawed footage from the cave, so it is the pilot uh, one in the original. So yeah, they would have rebuilt it to be like that. So. And so, mo moving forward from that original one where you have that big pigtail that plugged into the Christmas tree lights, and, yeah. and uh, uh, you had a lot of compromises in some of those early ornaments because of needing to accommodate the electronics, which were much larger than you've been able to move on to like this year's Discovery ornament, which is super thin, super flat, and looks we hope it's pretty, pretty, pretty solidly awesome. like the actual model. Yeah, the, uh, again, the advantage of working from digital files, uh, that the, the ship itself has such a thin profile that our sculptors would have had a really difficult time getting the detail into that that uh, we Think that our customers expect from us at this point. We were able to light it. It, it lights really well, and, uh, and, and that's it's a beautiful feature. When, when I first saw the Discovery design, that was one of my first thoughts. Was like, oh my god, how is Hallmark going to light this? <laughs> I'm thinking, I think, where, where, where are the batteries? Yeah, where are the batteries? The wires go, and all that. My, my, my thought was we could just uh, actually just affix candles to either side and place them themselves, and just light those. So, John, if we go back in time and then find angry message board posts about the design of the Discovery online, there'll, there'll be one that has you complaining about, how is Hallmark going to make an ornament about this? My, 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 I mean, my own challenge accepted, man. I mean, you know, what, what next, what do you want us to do next? My own personal story about, about the Discovery design of, in Hallmark is that you guys were on the absolute final pass of this last summer to, to go into production on it. And they changed the lighting scheme on the ship. Late I remember process. that. Yeah, you remember that too. Uh, and you guys were sitting there waiting for about a week while we waited on the what was going to be the final, final, final lighting scheme, which we weren't going to know until the Comic Con trailer was read. My, my favorite lighting story for a Hallmark moment, though, was when we did the Enterprise for First Contact. 
who actually had a blue color deflector dish, our sculptor went and saw the movie, noticed that the movie had it in gold rather than blue, called our manufacturer overseas and got that lighting changed and we were one of the only um, uh, representatives with the correct lighting scheme on the market at the time. I'll also tell you, if you watch Discovery really, really carefully, you will see the lighting scheme changes from episode to episode on some shows. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's not the same ship. There are these kind of shows. Uh, of course. And some of them have very bright magenta lighting, I, I, and some of them have yellow lighting. I think it depends on what the dark gray looked that day. The mice, <laughs> when you travel through the mycelial network, it changes the nature of the light yeah. emitted from the nacelles because of trace spores on the... Yeah. And during combat. I'll keep working on well. During combat, obviously. Um, the more brand the tardigrade eats, the more red shift you get in the lights. <laughs> Thomas! <laughs> Hi! Uh, you've now worked on a lot of ships uh, with Star Trek Online, and uh, this is uh, one of your shots, I believe. Yeah, this is uh, my day. I was able to work on both of these versions of the Enterprise, and one of the awesome things about Star Trek Online, uh, much like timelines, is that you can put these two ships next to each other in an environment and see, like, wow, the Kelvin ships are real big. <laughs> um, yep. But uh, it's, it's cool. It's, uh, we did this for the 15th anniversary of Star Trek. Um, we had our Agents of Yesterday expansion, so we rebuilt the original series Enterprise, and then we added the Kelvin Timeline Enterprise to the game, along with the, a few other things from the Kelvin movies. And it's just um, it's really cool to see the continuity. You know, even after 50 years, you still see the, the same spirit of the ship uh, in there. Now another thing with your ships is you built them in a way that players can customize. So it creates an almost limitless canvas. You can see here this one basic Klingon ship. You can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this is one of our command battle cruisers. Um, and so we have a Romulan Federation and Klingon versions of these ships. Um, and it's a it's a bundle, so you buy three different ships, and they all look different. But then you can swap, you can swap the bridge section, you can swap the pylons, you can swap the cells. That's one of the things that I think really makes Star Trek Online unique as a uh, Star Trek game is um, you can customize your ships. You can change parts like this. You can change the color. You can change the hull materials, and so it really becomes your ship. It's not just oh, that's another galaxy class. It's like this is my. You know, this is my USS Sentinel or whatever. So this is a Federation uh, Command Battle Cruiser Green. I mean, we're showing some of the different options you can do there, different saucer sections, all sorts of things. It's really exciting. Um, how, it's really challenging to build ships this way uh, and also try to make them as accurate as we can. And, and in some cases, we've had to make some sacrifices um, so our customization scheme works. But um, you know, I think players really respond to that. They really love that part about STO. Um, there's a saying that players have about Star Trek Online that the real end game is Space Barbie. <laughs> so, and they're, they're talking about how they can uh, uh, customize their ships. And I, think that's, and I think that's been something we've seen on the shows as well as you've seen different classes of ships like the Galaxy class and the Nebula class that seem to take that basic space frame and then you know, mix and match the different parts on it uh, to absurd degrees when you get to the Wolf 359 ships. Uh, what, what this looks like actually is Ryan Church concept art. So if you've ever seen any of Ryan's designs, which for the for the JJ films, is that this is what he does. He, he will do like 20, 30 variations of the ship with long nacelles, short nacelles, round nacelles, square nacelles. Yeah, and it, it's a fun process for us when we get to make a ship that does allow you to customize it because we can sort of cater to people who like certain things. Some people love the Prometheus, like aggressive, angular, triangular saucer, but other people really want just a circular saucer. So this lets us serve the, the aesthetics of, of uh, everybody. And here's a couple of your other ship designs, uh, a Reliant class. Right, so um, Star Trek Online, the main game takes place in the 25th century, about 30 years after Nemesis in the Prime timeline, which has been really exciting for us because that means that we get to make our own Star Trek starships, like original starships, 
Um, but it obviously inspired by uh, you know existing ships. So this, for example, is a uh, 25th century version of the Miranda. Like what you know, what's an upgraded modern take on the Miranda uh, layout? And uh, so we decided to name after the Reliant, um, tragically lost um, in the uh, Genesis planet incident. And um, you know, we, we go through just like uh, Ryan Church and any concept artist, we go through um, many many. Uh, uh, times of iteration and different silhouettes and footprints and trying to figure things out. Then we have a concept sketch and then we you know implement it in the game. Uh, but it's a really exciting process. I have a saying that like I know a design is ready when I can hear the music, like hear the Star Trek theme music when I look at it. Because that's just because for all of our ships we make the players are fly. They're all hero ships, right? So we want to make sure that they all have a good spirit to them beyond just like, okay, now we're going to shove in the cell over here, right? So that's really important to me personally as the lead ship artist on the game. And this is, uh, real quick, this is a, uh, for our Agents of Yesterday expansion, we made a lot of uh, original series era starships. So this is a battle cruiser uh, from the TOS era, heavily inspired by the Akira, but then we, we added some other TOS flair to it. Now, this is an image from an Anovos product. This is the shuttle bay of the uh, USS Shenzhou from Discovery. Uh, it gets to the level of uh, excruciating and almost insane detail that goes into the, the replicas that you do. They're, they're, they're expensive, but there's a level of workmanship and detail. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, why you know, uh, you guys, John Evelyn, in specific, feels like the need to build things out to this level. So it's like, yeah, let's be little tiny shuttle crafts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great uh, question, and the answer really is because we wanted to share. Uh, not only we don't want to just build a ship that looks good on the outside. We also want to build it so that you can actually take your parts on the inside of the ship. Like the shuttle bay is definitely one of the areas that you see a lot of in Discovery. Um, same thing, like discovery right there. Um, lavender. <laughs> this is a color change. Lavender. It's a color uh, change. Like it's a <laughs> it is. It, the color changes. Um, we've got. This is our second version because our first version was a little more silver. When we did the prototype, this is the actual final color. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we. Uh, one of the ideas behind this was that it, you don't really see it well. Enough. Or it's not illuminated well in the show. For space is dark. Space is dark. And not as much dark than it is on Star Trek. Actual yeah. space. Actual space. <laughs> there's, there's, not all, there's not always a convenient sun beaming nice, even light across the surface Absolutely. of the show. Absolutely. So we wanted to really show, when it comes to the multi show this in a different environment, which is going to be your house, right? Your house is going to be well lit, so we wanted to make sure that you could see all. Well, so for most people. It's but that to me is it's one of the biggest problems with ships is color, because it's not just you know now you're getting a CG model, but what you realize is things like the how reflective the ship is in Discovery. Actually, seeing what color the Discovery is is quite a surprise if you just watch the TV show. Oh no, it's you know, one of the beautiful surprises that we saw was that these ships are very detailed and very colorful. So we wanted to really bring that out in the models. Yeah, and they're very, the particular discovery, they use a lot of color in the lighting of the ship. So, you know, unless you have a, very, a lot of bright blue light in your house, your model's probably not going to look the way it does in the show. And you learn things like the way they change how reflective the ships are. They'll, they'll change that from shot to shot to make it look good in that shot. So it's not a simple thing. No, it's not. Don't you wish you could change how reflective they were from You're, shot to shot? No, yeah. right, in, in yeah. every environment, yeah, we can just change. I mean, that's, that, but that's something we have to deal with too, is, is we sort of have to figure out, okay, this is the reference we have, but this is what it looks like in the show. Yeah. And like, there's, there's sort of like two halves warring, like, I want it to look the way it does there. I want to look, make the platonic ideal version like they made it, but people are going to expect it to look like it looked on the TV show. And so at least we have control of the environments uh, in our games.
but you guys don't really <laughs> control over what people's houses are lit. Exactly. I think if you buy a local ship, you should actually get a right way to get for it. Spend that much money on it, you should have a right to set. Absolutely. It's as long as it's reasonable. As long as we keep Santa Claus out of the grid. That's all we want. We're all, all, all going to have a lot of green light in front of you. Works out fine. Or tinsel. Or you know. So what you're seeing here is um, basically the ships being built. And they're built individually. They're not like built in batches. So um, each ship takes about 200 man hours just to build. It takes about like, a team of four to five people. Um, and this is the discovery, and you're seeing also the exposed cutout for the crew corridors and the, uh, the quarters, and as well as the mess hall. Um, one of the, that's, that's one of the things I think is great about this, is it does have those pieces that you don't really know are there that pop off. You can look and it's like, oh, there's crew quarters there, or you can take, take a panel off of the nacelles, and you can see, you know, the, the warp core core in there. Yeah. The warp um, and the other thing in talking to like John Dublin is he's very meticulous. He wants to make sure that the windows on the outside of the ship line up to how you would see them inside the ship. So you get that really uh, intense level. Of the visual effects the artists would like that as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with 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 some of you, uh, you're you're dealing with. Um, uh, ben, you've done it a little bit, and, and with um, uh, Thomas and, and um, what's what's more difficult for you? Is it is it taking an existing ship like let's say the original Constitution class Enterprise, which comes with a lot of expectations, uh, or is it harder when you're doing with something like the Phase Two Enterprise, or you're creating a brand new class of ship? For, for the game, um, what's more difficult for you to create? Um, for me, the hardest thing is something where I know somebody out there somewhere has a picture that I haven't seen <laughs> um, that shows a bit of the ship I can never find out about. Um, so if you do, I mean, Discovery is really interesting because I think our model is particularly something like the Klingon Bird of Prey. It's like people are very critical of that ship online. They see our model and they go, well, this is really nice. Um, and it's the first time people get to actually really understand them when they get a physical model of them. It, it um, does make a huge difference when you are able to see it in three dimensions. And like pick it up. And pick it up and turn it around and see all the angles of it. Like, oh, yeah, um, but yeah, that's an enterprise. Where it's tough is when it's something that we have partial reference for. So, the Wolf 359 chips are a really good example. Um, you know, there are a handful of pictures of them. Some of them, people took pictures. I mean, those ships, just so everybody knows, they were kit bashed, they were made, came into the art department, uh, Rick and Mike took some pictures of them, and then took a Dremel to them. Um, so, after that, it was only the Dremel version that anyone could see. Um, but I know someone somewhere probably has some pictures that Tony Money and gave someone a party. Um, were you tempted to, to kind of change them a little bit? Because like the Niagara or class... Put deflect the dishes on them, you mean? Well, yeah. Uh, well, like the Niagara class specifically, I think, is the one with the ambassador hull and then the three galaxy class nacelles around the outside. And I always thought, man, that looks real weird. Like <laughs> Some of those kitbash ships, I mean, the, the, you know, there are lots of kitbash ship stories. Um, some of them are so hideous, um, <laughs> but we try as hard as we can to be as true to the show as possible. I mean, I've had conversations on Discovery actually with like the guys in the art department. They're like, "Yeah, it's not meant to look like that." I mean, yeah, but it does. Um, and you know, you'll get people like Scott Snyder or William Budge, and they say, "Well, you know, we'd really rather this was fixed or whatever." But saying, "Yeah, but it's what appears on screen." So. You know, another thing they changed their mind on discovery is the position of the registries and the ship name. So, you know, when you see the Gagarin, it has a great big USS Gagarin on it. But when you see the Carolera, it's got a tiny one. Um, and they're like, well, no, because we realized that it was wrong when it was on the Carolera. But it's like, well, but yeah, but it's on screen. It's on screen. So. And we saw it. Um, you know, you get things like one of the first really big complaints here, we put the Akira 
And it was going, you left off the name. It's going, yeah, so did I allow. Uh, and, but people don't realise that because they have it in their heads what it should look like, which isn't necessarily the same as what it actually looks like. I, uh, I think our time is almost up. Do we have any uh, questions? Yeah. When are you guys going to do the Franz Joseph ships? Oh, well, actually, I'm having dinner with John tonight. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will drop money on those yeah. right now. It's a, there's, a le there's a slight legal issue uh, no, with what? the Franz Joseph ones. That, I mean, that, that's all fixed. It's fixable, but uh, not yet fixed. It's fixable. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I'd love to do the Franz Joseph ships. Um, most of them, anyway. Well, Ben, if you get to do them, I want to do them. <laughs> okay, okay, well then, the, the real important question that I have for everybody on the panel is, what is your personal favorite ship? Um, I, I mean, it's a pat answer, but it really is the original Enterprise, the NCC-1701. Um, no bloody A, B, C, or D. Um, it started everything off. What I really love about that ship um, is that because Matt Jeffries was, you know, he was in the service and he did a lot of aviation art, he really looked at it not just with an artist's eye, but with a really practical eye, uh, kind of a layman engineer and form, and it looks like something that maybe we could build someday, and Star Trek has always been aspirational to me, and it's always been about what we could do as, you know, the human race if we got, got our stuff together, and I think the original Enterprise, it's not super outlandish, it's not super high tech, you know, it looks like it's something that that we could build if we, we figure out how. So that's that's always been my favorite. Probably the Defiant, because there's so much in show history about it. I love that Cisco worked on it from the time he was at Utopia Punishment. I'm not gonna say that right. I got really close. Um, I love that it comes on as a character in the series, and that, how do you talk about it? It's a tough little ship. Yeah, it is. Stands up every time, so uh, I love the Defiant. I'd go with the first ship that Dave Ward and I created for our, uh, writing for pocketbooks, the uh, Daedalus class, USS Lovell, NCC 470, also available. Hey, uh, the was <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting, you should mention it. That was a nice ship to do. I have to say that my favorite ship would be the uh, 1701D, simply because I grew up with it. Star Trek The Next Generation was the first show that I watched growing up, and it has a special place in my heart because of that reason. Yeah. And Pam, it's probably like pulling teeth to ask you to pick one. <laughs> Who's your favorite <laughs> child? Yeah, it is. I mean, the originals of... I, this, this thing about seeing something physically is really interesting. So you, you get this little box that comes from China, in my case, and you take it out, and you look at it, and you go, oh, that's what it looks like. Or, oh, wow. Um, and I've had a couple of oh, wow moments when I've opened the box. Um, the, the, the original series one is that, and it's because of the colour. Um, I have to uh, thank a lot of other people for that, but that was so satisfying to see that. Um, but the ship that I think turned out, just every time we do it, it turns out really, really well, is the Reliant. Um, I, I don't know why, it's really hard to put the finger on it, um, but we've just got the big one of the Reliant in, there's one on the stand and come and look at it, it's great, and we got it right first time, and it was great when it was little, and we got it right first time, and it's just something about it, it's just really, really satisfying, and I, I can't quite, you know, thank God half side the blueprint's upside down. I was hoping you were going to mention that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah, I've been gagging to say that since you mentioned the Reliant Club. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, yeah, that's the one that I just think has been... You know, for, for me, I, it, it, it's, there's so many ships that have been in Star Trek that I really, really love, but it is virtually impossible for me to pick anything other than the original, and that was really driven home a few years ago when I was fortunate enough to be at the Smithsonian when they were working on the conservation and seeing that ship up close and personal and starting to understand what went into creating it. Uh, it's been absolutely the career highlight for me and so many great things I've been able to do in this job. But uh, 
when you see that ship up close and personal, see what Matt Jeffries put together, it was, and, and to know how unlike anything else, it was a time of flying saucers. And um, to see what he was able to put together and how it has stood the test of time was and how hard to top. Brilliantly, people have been able to take that basic shape and reinvent it in so many ways and so satisfactorily. Anyway, I think we're about to be played off, so uh, thank you very much for uh, coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,